स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया Hello everyone this is Dr Vishal Tribedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati and what we were discussing we were discussing about the biomolecules and uh, the understanding of the biomolecule is very important for us to understand for us to realize the uh, the importance of these biomolecules in running the several types of cellular activities so so far what we have discussed we have discussed about the Uh, nucleic acids so in that we have discussed about the dna and rna and these two molecules are important for the information to be stored in from the one generation to another generation and that's how they are actually going to relay the information from the one generation to the next generations and subsequent to that we were also discussing about the carbohydrates and carbohydrates are mainly been required for energy production and as well as in some cases they are also been part of the um, building blocks where they are actually modifying the some of the crucial cellular factors and other things so uh, in if you recall in our previous lecture we discuss about the different types of carbohydrates we discuss about the monosaccharides disaccharides and polysaccharides in addition we have also discuss about the different types of uh, structural as well as the biochemical details of uh, these different types of uh, carbohydrates and uh, Uh, the carbohydrates are present in the linear chain or to the cyclized form uh, and they are also showing the different types of isomeric properties so with this brief discussion in the previous lecture in today's lecture we are going to discuss about the how the carbohydrates are participating into the energy productions so as you can see that the energy is the ultimate source or ultimate thing what is required for running the metabolic reactions whether it is a prokaryotic cell or whether it is a eukaryotic cell whether it is a eukaryotic animal cell or to the plant cells so when we talk about the energy production we can actually be able to have we have to run the cellular metabolism and cellular metabolism could be of two types it could be a anabolic anabolism or to the catabolism so what is mean by the anabolism anabolism means is a biosynthetic pathway which means anabolism means it is actually been uh, going to synthesize the new molecules if you recall when we were talking about the nucleic acid we have discussed about how the nucleotides are being synthesized and what are the composition of the nucleotides similarly if you want to develop the sugars or if you want to synthesize the sugar also that also has to be synthesized under the anabolic reactions then we have the catabolic reactions the catabolic reactions are the reactions which are responsible for the energy producing reaction so in this you are actually going to have the different types of metabolic pathways or metabolic uh, reactions and these uh, metabolic pathways or reactions are ultimately going to destroy or oxidize the given biomolecule and that's how they are actually going to produce the atp as well as the other reducing equivalents so we are going to discuss about the catabolic uh, pathways and how the catabolic pathways are uh, or what are the different types of catabolic pathways are involved into the breakdown of the uh, the carbohydrates and then at the result you, they are actually going to produce the 
uh, energy in the form of ATP or the reducing equivalent such as the NAD, NADH. So when we talk about the cellular metabolism, the cellular metabolism of the carbohydrates, it actually going to start with the glycolysis. So glycolysis is, is the first pathway which is involved into the catabolism of the carbohydrates. So glycolysis is the central to carbohydrate metabolism and it is a universal pathway which is found into the prokaryote or the eukaryotic cell. So glycolysis is a, a metabolic pathway which is present in the cytosol and it is actually being present in all the different all the cells which are utilizing the carbohydrate as a source of energy irrespective of whether it is a prokaryotic cell or the eukaryotic cell what is going to happen in glycolysis it is going to break down of the six membered glucose into the two three membered carbon sugar to feed the grape cycle in the presence of the oxygen or it is going to send through the anaerobic oxidation in the absence of the oxygen. So what the glycolysis is going to do is it is actually going to take the six membered carbon sugar at like the glucose right and it is actually going to convert that into the three membered carbon sugar and uh, such as pyruvate. And, uh, it is going to have the different types of reactions through which it is actually going to do this kind of breakdown and under these conditions it is actually going to utilize the energy what is being stored into the glucose into the form of the ATP or to the uh, NADPH. So it is actually going to produce an ATP as well as the NADH and these two molecules are actually going to provide the energy into the cell. Hence it plays a crucial role for the adaptation of a living organism under the different types of stress conditions. So glycolysis is the major pathway which actually allows the organism to adopt for the different types of environmental conditions. As you can say, you see that it is actually going to break down the six membered uh, glucose into the three uh, membered uh, uh, carbon sugars and that three member carbon sugar which is the pyruvate is eventually going to go into the Krebs cycle but it goes into the Krebs cycle only if the oxygen is present because and if it is oxygen is not present then it is actually going to feed the pyruvate into the anaerobic pathway and that's how depending on the uh, uh, the availability of the oxygen uh, the uh, the glycolysis can be able to shuttle the final product into the two different types of pathway and that's how it actually can allow the adaptation of the different types of stress conditions. The glycolysis is a 10 step chemical reaction to enable the glucose for its optimal oxidation. So let's see what are the different uh, steps what you are going to have. So in the glycolysis what as I said you know it is a 10 step uh, reactions. So, in going to have the 10 steps like you see here, so step number 1, step 2, step 3, step 4, step 5, 6, 7, 8 and 9. So, it's going to have a uh, 10 step reactions and uh, this is the actually the another step. Okay. So, we are going to discuss each and every step and we are also going to discuss how the what are the relevance of these steps and so on. So in the step one, step one is called as the phosphorylation of the glucose. So you can imagine that as soon as you have a cell and if this, this cell is actually going to receive the glucose from outside, this glucose is going to be available for the glycolysis. Uh, this glucose is available for the glycolysis, but as the glucose is a uncharged molecule, it required to be trapped inside the uh, cell, right? So that process is for, it's being done in the step one. So glucose is going to be get phosphorylated, and what will happen into the, when the glucose is going to be phosphorylated? So glucose is a uncharged molecule, and once you do the phosphorylation, it is actually going to develop the negative charge, right? And because of that, it is actually going to be trapped inside the cell, and it is going to be committed for the uh, oxidation process. So glucose produced after the glycogen breakdown is phosphorylated by the glucokinase. So, so there are two enzymes which are involved into the glucose uh, uh, phosphorylation. One is called as the hexokinase which is present in the all other tissues whereas the, uh, it is also been 
uh, phosphorylated by another enzyme which is called as glucokinase. So, glucokinase is only, passer, uh, only present in the liver cell whereas the hexokinase is present in the all other cells uh, or the hexokinase in all other tissues especially in muscles. In the phosphorylation reactions, the phosphate which is the gamma labeled phosphate group of ATP is transferred to the glucose to form the glucose 6 phosphate. The phosphorylation reaction of glucose to produce the glucose 6 phosphate marks the that particular molecule for the glycolysis and one molecule of ATP is going to be utilized in this step. So, what in the step 1 the glucose is actually going to be phosphorylated by the glucokinase in the liver cell or by the hexokinase by the in the other, all other cells especially the muscle cells and one molecule of ATP is going to be utilized in this process and as a result it is actually going to produce the glucose 6 phosphate. As soon as it generates the glucose 6 phosphate, it is actually going to cause the negative uh, charge on this particular glucose molecule. And as a result, that this glucose molecule which has entered into the cell cannot go out. It, if it, it wants to go out, then it cannot be a passive transport. It has to be an active transport. And because of this only, the first uh, phosphorylation is happening so that the glucose is going to be trapped inside the, um, inside the cytosol and it is going to be committed for the glycolysis. Then in the step 2, there will be a conversion of the glucose to the fructose 6 phosphate. So, this is a isomerization reaction. So, in the step 2, you are actually going to do the isomerization so that the glucose is going to be get converted into the fructose 6 phosphate and the enzyme what it is going to use is the phosphofracto isomerase. So, phosphorylated sugar produced in step 1 is converted into the fructose 6 phosphate by the action of the phosphofracto isomerase. Now, in the step 3, the step 3, it is actually going to do the another round of phosphorylation. So, another round of phosphorylation, so in the step 3, the phosphorylation of fructose 6-phosphate. So, in this step, the sugar is further phosphorylated at the carbon 1 to produce the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate by the action of the enzyme which is called as the phosphofractokinase. In the phosphorylation reactions, the phosphate that the gamma labeled phosphate group of ATP is transferred to the phosphorylated sugar to form the fructose 1 6 bisphosphate. One molecule of ATP is going to utilize in this process. So, fructose, so in the step 3, the fructose 6 phosphate is going to be phosphorylated with the help of the ATP and uh, it is going to generate the fructose 1 6 bisphosphate and the enzyme name is phosphofractokinase. So, you are you can see that it is actually going to consume the two molecule of ATP. One molecule is here, the another molecule is here, right. Now, once the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is being generated, it is going to be utilized by the another enzyme which is called as the aldolase and that is why it is going to generate the, uh, uh, it is going to be do the further degradation. So, in the step 4, there is called as the cleavage of the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So, as soon as the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is going to be generated, it is actually going to be cleaved in the step 4. So, this step is catalyzed by the enzyme aldolase or the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate aldolase to generate the glycerdehyde 3-phosphate and the dihydroxyacetone phosphate. So, as so as soon as the fructose 1 6 phosphate is generated, it is going to be act by the enzyme which is called as the aldolase and that aldolase is actually going to uh, bring the breakdown of this uh, six-membered carbon sugar into the th two three-membered uh, sugars. So, these uh, it is going to generate the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate and the dihydroxyacetone phosphate. These two are actually the isomeric forms. So, they are actually going to be uh, converted to each other by an enzyme which is called as the phosphotriose isomerase and because of that the dihydroxyacetone phosphate is going to be converted into the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate and the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate will further break down and that is how it is actually going to run the glycolysis. 
So in the step five, the interconversion of the triose phosphate. So the three carbon sugar formed in the step four undergo the internal conversion, and as the glyceraldehyde phosphate can readily be able to enter into the next step, the ketose generated in the step four is reversibly being converted into the glyceraldehyde three phosphate by the triose phosphate isomerase. So in the step five, uh, so this is the step five. It, uh, the dihydroxyacetone phosphate, which is being a keto sugar, is being converted into the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate by the enzyme, which is called as the phosphotriose isomerase. Now, in the step 6, uh, the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is going to be uh, produced the 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. So, in the step 6, the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is actually going to be get converted into the 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate and you can see that it is actually going to produce the one molecule of NADH. So, in this step, the one molecule of NADH is produced after the oxidation of the aldehyde group of the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate with the help of an enzyme which is called as the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. So, in the step 6, the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase is actually going to do the oxidation of the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and that's why the glyce the, this aldehyde group is going to be oxidized by the enzyme and it's going to produce a one molecule of NADH and the product what is going to be formed is 1,3-bis-phosphoglycerate. Now, 1,3-bis-phosphoglycerate will enter into the next step which is the step 7. In this step, the phosphate group from the 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate is removed by the phosphoglycerate kinase with an acyl group transferred to the ADP to generate the ATP molecule. So, in the next step, the 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, the phosphate is going to be taken up by this particular molecule by the enzyme which is called as the phosphoglycerate kinase and that's how the ADP is going to be converted into the ATP. So, this is going to be the first time when the ATP is going to be generated in the glycolysis whereas this is the first time when the uh, NADH is going to be generated. In the step 8, the conversion of the 3-phosphoglycerate to the 2-phosphoglycerate. So, in a two-step mechanism, the phosphoglycerate mutase catalyzes a reversible shift of the phosphorylation group to form the 2-phosphoglycerate. So, once the 3-phosphoglycerate is being produced, in the step 8, there will be a conversion of the 3-phosphoglycerate to the 2-phosphoglycerate. And so, there will be a shifting of the phosphorylated group from the second, third carbon to the second carbon by the enzyme which is called as the phosphoglycerate mutase. And once the 2-phosphoglycerate is going to be produced, it is going to be uh, entered into the next step which is called as the step 9. So, in the step 9, it is going to be a dehydration reactions. So, in the step 9, the enzyme enolase is going to catalyze a dehydration reactions and because of that, it is actually going to produce the phosphoenolpyruvate. So, in the step 9, the dehydration of the 2-phosphoglycerate to produce the phosphoenolpyruvate. The enzyme enolase catalyzes the dehydration reaction to produce the phosphoenolpyruvate, a compound with the high phosphate transfer potentials. So, it is this is this is going to have the high energy phosphate group, and uh, from the 2-phosphoglycerate, the enolase is actually going to remove the uh, the one molecule of water, and that's how it is actually going to produce the high energy, high phosphate containing molecule which is called as the phosphoenol pyruvate. And then in the phosphoenol pyruvate is going to enter into the last step which is the step number 10. And in this is the last step of the glycolysis, the phosphate group from the phosphoenol pyruvate is going to be transferred by the pyruvate kinase with the acyl uh, phosphate group transfer to the ADP to generate the ATP molecule. So, in the last step, the phosphoenol pyruvate, the phosphate group is going to be transferred from the phosphoenol pyruvate by the enzyme pyruvate kinase and that is how the ADP is going to be get converted into the ATP. So, this is the second time when the ATP is going to be generated and then it is going to produce the pyruvate and this pyruvate then further move on and it will enter into the 
Krebs cycle in the case of the oxygen is present. If the oxygen is not present, then this pyruvate will enter into the anaerobic oxidation and then if, if the oxygen is not present. So, that is how the pyruvate, once the pyruvate is being produced, then pyruvate will be transferred either to the mitochondria for the, uh, for the Krebs cycle or it is going to be sent for the anaerobic oxidations. Now, let us see how the energy is being uh, consumed or how the energy is going to be produced for, by after the glycolysis. So, what you see here is that wherever the energy is being utilized first to run this reaction. So, we have the first place where the ATP is going to be used. So, I am just writing the minus one so that I will tell you that these are the things where the ATP is being utilized. So, minus one. Then we have another place where the ATP is used. So, this is also minus 1. So, these are the two steps like the step number 1 and the step number 3. These are the places where the ATP is being utilized by the system so that it is actually going to energize the system so that it is actually going to uh, participate into the further breakdown reactions. And then what you see here is that the first molecule of ATP is being produced here and the second molecule of ATP is going to be produced here. Apart from that, it is also going to produce the one molecule of NADH, right? So, if you see the balance sheet, how the balance sheet of the ATP production within the glycolysis is, uh, you are going to see that the from the step 1 to step 4, so this is the step 4, this is the step 5. This is the step 6, this is the step 7, this is the step 8, this is 9 and this is 10. So, this is number 1, this is number 2, this is 3, this is 4, 5. So, what you see here is that from the step 1 to 4, there is a utilization of the energy by the system. And then from the 5 or 5 onward, there is a production. So, let us see how it is being done, okay. So, what you see here is a balance sheet, the ATP balance sheet. So, in the step 1 to 4, we are actually utilizing the 2 ATP. So, we are utilizing the 2 ATP, 1 ATP which is actually in the step 3, uh, step 1 and the second ATP which we are utilizing in the step 3, right. Then we have the generation of the two molecule of the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, right? Remember that when the aldolase is cleaving uh, and producing the two molecule of uh, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and the dihydroxyacetone phosphate and then there is a internal conversion and that is how the two molecule of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is being produced from the single glucose molecule. Now, in the step 6, there is a generation of NADH. So, that NADH is actually, so because there is a one molecule of NADH production from the one molecule of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and that is how there will be two molecule of NADH is going to be produced from the uh, single glucose molecule. And that is why, and each NADH is actually, when it is going to be gone to the electron transport chain, it is actually going to give you the 3 ATP. That is why the number of ATP what is going to be produced is 6, right? Because 2 into 3 is equal to 6 ATP molecule. Now, in the step 7, uh, there will be a generation of ATP. So, since we have the 2 molecule of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, we are actually going to see the production of 2 ATP. So, there will be 2 ATP molecule which are going to be produced. And then in the last step, the step 1, when the pyruvate is being generated, the, again we are actually going to have the ATP generation. And since we are starting with the 2 molecule of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, there will be 2 ATP molecule which are going to generate it. Now, if you see the net balance, net balance is that we have the 6 molecule, 2 molecule, 2 molecule. So, 10 molecule which are being generated and then we have utilized the 2 molecules. So, actually the 8 ATP molecule are going to be generated after the each glucose molecule oxidations. And that is only when the oxygen is present, okay. If the oxygen is present, you are going to see the 8 ATP molecule which are going to be generated. If the oxygen is not present, which means 
if there will be a uh, absence of oxygen then the electron transport chain is actually not going to be functional so this 3 atp is this 6 atp is not going to be produced and in that case the net uh, uh, atp that is going to be formed is only the 2 right because 2 is what you are utilizing and the 2 4 what you are actually producing and because of that it is actually going to give you the 2 net ATP if the in the absence of oxygen. So in the presence of oxygen there will be a net production of 8 ATP in the absence of oxygen the net production is only the 2 ATP. Now let us see how uh, and what are the different steps at which the glycolysis can be uh, can be regulated. So you see that the glycolysis is a 10 step reaction and uh, if you recall the first step itself is the phosphorylation reactions. So as soon as the glucose will enter into the cytosol or glucose will enter into the cell it is actually being phosphorylated by the glucokinase or the hexokinase and that is why it is actually going to be committed for the glycolysis. So that is the first step where the glycolysis can be regulated. You know that when we take the food, the glucose is being, the, the polysaccharides are going to be digested by the different types of enzyme, what is present in the stomach or the small intestine and then these monosaccharides are going to be absorbed by the, uh, from the elementary canal into the blood. So once the blood sugar level is going to be go high, then the insulin, which is a, a hormone is actually going to bind the insulin receptor and as a result the, once the insulin is going to bind the insulin receptor it is actually going to open up the insulin uh, the glucose tr uh, transporters so once it will open up the glucose transporter the glucose is actually going to be entered into the cell okay now once the insulin is going to low level uh, so as soon as there will be a increase in glucose level there will be a insulin production and that insulin will go and bind to the insulin receptor and uh, as a result there will be a transport of glucose once the transport of glucose is happening then this glucose is going to be committed or it is actually going to increase the rate of glycolysis so when the insulin level is going to decrease the glucose transporters are going to move from the cell membrane to the intracellular storage pool where they can be recycled. So as soon as the blood glucose is going to be down then the, there will be a decrease in insulin level and as a result the, the receptors or the, the channels what are present onto the cell surface is also going to be uh, stored into the intracellular vesicles and that is how they are actually going to be recycled back onto the membrane. Uh, and they were actually going to utilize on a second round of the transport. So the entry of glucose is mainly being uh, regulated by the hormone which is called as the insulin hormone. Apart from that the glycolysis can also be uh, regulated at two event when is called as the covalent modification the other one is called as the allosteric regulation of the enzyme of the glycolysis. So the uh, allosteric uh, covalent modification means that you are actually going to regulate the enzyme by the covalently modifying. So one of the classical covalent modification is that you are actually going to do the phosphorylations. So in this case if the pyruvate kinase uh, is phosphorylated it is going to be the less active if the pyruvate kinase is uh, dephosphorylated it is going to be more active. Dephosphorylated means the pyruvate kinase is present in the native form. It is going to be uh, more active if it is going to be phosphorylated then it is going to be less active. So when the uh, it is going to be uh, uh, you know when there is be a uh, uh, change in the blood glucose level it is actually going to change the phosphorylated as well as the dephosphorylated level of uh, pyruvate in uh, pyruvate kinase into the cell and that is how it is actually going to regulate the uh, level of the phosphorylated pyruvate kinase versus the uh, dephosphorylated or the native uh, pyruvate kinase and that is how it is actually going to regulate the glycolysis. 
Uh, apart from that, we can also have the allosteric regulation. So, allosteric regulation is a regulation where the molecule does not bind the into the uh, or does not modify the enzyme. It actually bows and bind to the allosteric sites and that is how it actually modulates their activities. So, that is happening for the, uh, the enzyme which is called as the phosphofractokinase and the phosphofractokinase is going to be allosterically being modified by the uh, molecule which is called as the fructose 1,2,6-bisphosphate and it is uh, going to allosterically regulate the activity of the phosphofractokinase and that is how it is going to regulate the production of the uh, uh, the fructose 16 bisphosphate and you know that if there will be an increase in the production of the fructose 16 bisphosphate it is actually going to increase the glycolysis level so this is all about the glycolysis what we have discussed so far we have discussed about the uh, the different steps of the uh, the uh, metabolic reactions what is happening into the glycolysis what is the energy production within the glycolysis and under the different uh, environmental conditions how the energy production is going to be modulated and in addition to that we have also discussed about the regulation of the glycolysis by the different means either it will be by the entry of the glucose into the cell by the mean of the uh, insulin hormone or by the covalent as well as the allosteric regulations of the different enzyme what is present into the glycolysis. So, with this I would like to conclude my lecture here. In our subsequent lecture, we are going to discuss about the some more biomolecules. Thank you.